just coming in. There are handouts at the table in the back. Everybody also will sign in. We would appreciate that very, very much. We've got about a minute and a half, and we're going to get started and kicking off our brand new series tonight. It's, it's a series on discipleship, and uh, I think that you will benefit from it. There is so much packed into this one chapter of Scripture, Romans chapter 12. Uh, before we begin, let me remind all of our Spanish folk that tomorrow night, 6.30, is our Cinco de Mayo Spanish feast. If you have not signed up, please be sure and do so tonight so that we have a count. I spoke with Carlos today, and he's anticipating between 80 and 100 people uh, for this festival, and we're very excited to be able to uh, celebrate the Spanish culture, which uh, encompasses more than just one nationality, and uh, it's going to be a fun evening. We have a surprise guest that's going to be a real fun treat for everybody both adults and kids. And uh, so this event is specifically for our Spanish and Latino uh, families, and that'll be tomorrow night in the Family Life Center at 6.30. Uh, already have confirmation, and one of the other reasons that we're doing this is for outreach to families that do not attend our church, and this is possibly a, a, an open door for them to come and get connected. And uh, Carlos told me that he has 20 people already that do not attend our church from the Spanish community that are planning to be with us. So that's exciting to be able to meet new people and connect with them in their culture. All right, let's have a word of prayer real quick, and then we're going to read Romans chapter 12. Father, thank you for the beautiful day that you have given to us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you are doing in our church. And Father, we just rejoice at the increase that you're giving. Thank you for the impact that we're being able to make for the kingdom of God. And Lord, as we sit at your feet tonight, may you feed us from the word. I pray that you will anoint me, that I can effectively communicate the word of God this evening. And I pray, Lord, that you will accomplish what you desire through these next eight weeks as we study the Word of God in Romans chapter 12, and it's in Christ's name we pray, and everybody said amen. If you have your Bibles or your phones, get them out with me, and we're going to start, and I'm going to read the entirety of Romans chapter 12. There's 21 verses, and then we're going to start tonight, and our lesson title this evening is How to Give God What He Wants the Most, How to Give God what he wants the most. That's the title of our lesson tonight. I'm reading from the NIV. Follow along with me. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able 
to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. And just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. But on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, this message series that we're beginning tonight is for you if you can answer yes to any of these following statements. Listen carefully. You're spiritually stuck. You're tired of the spiritual status quo. You wish you knew what God really wanted from you. You long to break free from some habitual sin. You desire to grow spiritually to a level that you've never attained. You need a clear pathway to spiritual maturity. And you are discipling other believers. So if you can answer yes to any of those questions, these next eight lessons are for you in particular. Recent research has shown that church programs are not producing mature Christians. Did you hear that? The research is out and it says that our church programs are not producing mature Christians. And many are trying lots of dead-end, theologically flawed, and quick-fix spiritual approaches that have left many in the church performing and exhausted, feeling guilty and ashamed, prisoners of false expectations, disappointed and disillusioned, angry and bitter, leaving the church and quietly going through the religious motions with little sense of God's power or presence. Think about it. If you are ready for a transformation and for the journey of your lifetime. I encourage you to buckle in, get ready, 
because we're going to delve into this chapter of Scripture that literally can be life changing. And I'm not just saying that to fill the air with words. I believe that if we will study together and learn from these verses, it can literally change our Christian walk. It can cause us to grow in the grace and knowledge and become the maturing body of believers that Christ has called us to be. So here's the question. What is a disciple. What is a disciple? I've just read to you the entire 21 verses of Romans chapter 12. And so I ask this question, what does an authentic follower of Christ look like? So as you open your Bible again and we look at Romans chapter 12, we're going to discover in these verses the profile of an R. 12 disciple. Now what do I mean by R12? Romans 12. Are you a Romans 12 disciple? So there are five things that I want us to first of all look at entirely and then we're going to break down each of these things individually and tonight we're going to concentrate specifically on number one. Write this in. Surrendered to God. Number one, surrendered to God. Number two, separate from the world. That's found in verse two. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Number three, sober in self-assessment. That is disclosed in verses three through eight. Number four, serving in love. That's found in verses 9 through 13. And lastly of all, write this in, supernaturally responding to evil with good. Let me repeat them again. Number one, surrendered to God. Number two, separate from the world. Number three, sober in self-assessment. Number four, serving in love. And number five, supernaturally responding to evil with good. And that is found in verses 14 through 21. Now, as we begin this journey, I want to remind you that it's not your religious activity and it's not your legalistic keeping of rules. It's not being a dutiful soldier fulfilling a cause that God wants. No, He wants our lives and our hearts in intimate, joyful relationship with Him. That's what God wants from you. And the great majority of Christians have been taught that life is about coming to know Christ personally, being saved, being good, and then helping other people get saved. That's what we've been taught traditionally all of our lives from Sunday school up to big church in the sanctuary. Now please don't get me wrong. Evangelism is very important and leading people to Christ is at the top of God's priority. But the other half of the message has been sorely neglected. The part about God's dream that you become a precious and cherished son or daughter that is living in deep union with God. Deep union. Not superficial, not surface relationship, but a deep union with God. What does he say? If you abide in me and I abide in you. It's not just about going through our religious duty. It's not about just showing up and checking our attendance in on a church service. It's not even about us paying our tithes, to be very frank and honest with you. It is about you connecting with God, abiding in God, and having a deep union with God. Because God's dream and plan for you and me is all about relationship. Can I hear an amen? 
Because you see what we've misconstrued in our Christian theology. God's desire is not for our performance. But for us to learn to live out His grace and favor that we already possess. God's primary agenda is to make us more and more like His Son so that we can enjoy and love Him and love others the way that He loves them. Last week we talked about looking in that mirror that we can become so like God that when we look in the mirror we see the reflection of Jesus Christ rather than our own image. You say, well, Pastor Rod, is that really possible? It is absolutely possible. We can actually get in Him, get up in Christ. We can, in Him, we live and move and have our existence. We can get to a point where we reflect so much of God-likeness that people don't even recognize who we are. That's the goal, folks. That's what we want to attain to. And so... God's dream and plan for us is about relationship, not performance. God's primary agenda is for us to be conformed to the image of His Son. My passion and my challenge over the next few weeks is that you, as an individual believer, dare to come to the place in your life where you are so in sync with God and you feel so alive and vibrant and filled with purpose. That's what God wants for us, all of us. And that's not just for a select group of people. That's just not for the pastors that are on the paid staff. That's not just for the leaders of the band. No, it's for every person that has been conformed by the power of God and transformed by the blood of Jesus to conform to His image. That's what a disciple is. Someone what? Surrendered to God, separate from the world, sober in self-assessment, serving in love, and supernaturally responding to evil with good. So, point number one. What does God really want from you? Let's zero in right now on verse 1 of chapter 12. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Now, as we ponder this thought of being surrendered to God, I have included a a saying by A.W. Tozer. Listen, and I'm going to quote it. The whole outlook of mankind might be changed if we could all believe that we dwell under a friendly sky and that the God of heaven, though exalted in power and majesty, is eager to be friends with us. Do you know what some people's image of God is? This great, big, gigantic, bully image that has a beam in his hand just waiting to bop us on the head when we mess up. Do you know that that's some people's image of God? And part of that is the reflection of the kind of earthly father that they had. Do you know that some people cannot relate to the heavenly father because they had such a horrific and terrible relationship with their earthly father? But God is wanting to heal your sight. God is wanting to heal your heart so that you can come into a deep union with him. How many of you found that when you experienced new life in Christ, it also introduced you to new struggles? Because being saved was not a once and for all fix all for everything in life, was it? Absolutely not. In fact, the minute that you were brought out of darkness into his marvelous light, you have a target on your back from the enemy and adversary of hell. Who is that? Satan. 
who is like a roaring lion walking around seeking whom he can devour. Hello? Although your sins quickly vanished upon your confession of faith, others seemed impossible to overcome. And little by little, we learned how to get to know God and understand his word so that he could talk back to us. I had a, a family just last week uh, contact me. Uh, they have a 15-year-old son, and they said, Pastor, we're trying to find um, some good material because our son is coming to us and saying that he believes the Holy Spirit is speaking to him in dreams and visions and during the night, and we're not sure how to guide him with this or how to help him determine to hear the voice of God. Well, do you know how exciting that was to me? as the pastor of this church, that there's a 15-year-old kid in the house that think, my God, I got Holy Ghost goosebumps all over my body, that's thinking that God, the Holy Spirit, is trying and attempting to communicate with him as a 15-year-old young man. Oh, it just reminded me of the story of Eli and how that they thought, oh, God must be speaking. Well, go back and say, speak, Lord. What we need is a generation of people that can hear the voice of God. How exciting that it is a young man of this church that's wanting to know how do I hear the voice of God. I found that most Christians don't really understand what God wants from them. I think most Christians are confused about what God wants from us. Can I make this very simple? He wants you, all of you. Not a part, not half. He wants all. We just came through a series called Lordship. What is Lordship? He is either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. Does that make sense? And this missing power and the absent joy can only come as you understand and apply the truth of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, only when you and I learn to surrender. We just finished a two-week series on love and marriage. At the end of both of those weeks, I left you with this statement. To give all is frightening. To surrender all in marriage is frightening. To surrender all in marriage is frightening. But it's the only way to get the maximum return. Not only does that apply to marriage, it also applies to our union with Christ. To give all and to surrender all to Jesus is frightening. But it's the only way that you will ever live the abundant life that he has called you to enjoy. Somebody say amen. So God wants you and me to surrender all that we are, all that we have, all that we ever hope to be in submission to Him. He wants to have the same place in our hearts that He possesses in the entire universe. Where is that? On the throne. He wants to be on the throne in your life. He wants to be in control of your life. He wants to lead you, guide you, comfort you, give you wisdom, show you direction, order your steps, and on and on the list can go if we simply would learn to surrender. Say that word, surrender. He wants you to believe that He is good. And that every good and perfect gift comes from above. He wants you to believe that He is kind and loving and gentle. And that we would entrust all of ourselves to Him knowing that He always, say always, He always has our best in mind. He wants us to bring all of our dreams, our future, 
our jobs, our, our, our friends, our family, our mate, our career, our academics, to him with open palms, not that he has to pry it out of our hands. He wants us to bring everything so that he might reign in our hearts as he reigns in this universe. So many believers know and love God and yet do not experience his joy and his power and his presence anywhere near the way that God longs for them to know him. So many Christians, so many, do not have fulfilling lives. They don't have joy unspeakable. They don't understand his that, that, that you can find joy in his presence every single day. And if you're tired of all the rules and all the formulas and all the religious activities and even well-meaning church programs that promise transformation but don't deliver, then tonight I am inviting you to join me on this journey of grace and faith and relationships that lead to genuine transformation. No one in this room, including myself, and I admit wholeheartedly, I haven't arrived. I've been doing this a long time, but I still haven't arrived. I've been in ministry 40 years, I still haven't arrived. There are still things in him yet to discover that have never been revealed. Do you believe that? So here's the second question. Pastor Rod, why is it so hard to surrender to God? I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 11. And let's focus in on verse 29. Matthew 11 and verse 29. Listen. Jesus is speaking these words. And he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Why is it so hard to surrender to God? To help us tonight recalibrate our view of this word commitment and surrender, I want to share with you two stories as present-day parables. Stay with me, okay? The Bible teaches us that Christ taught his disciples in parables. And he would take stories of his day, uh, customs and traditions of his day, and he would teach them godly ways and biblical principles so that they could learn from these very simple stories that he told. I have two stories. I'm going to call the first one case number one and the second one case study number two. And I want to share with you two real stories that happened. These are real, genuine uh, stories that happened to two individual people, and they were recorded. The first guy's name is John. He's a 32-year-old engineer, and he loves to go to estate sales and look for antique furniture and other potentially valuable items that other people overlook. One particular weekend, the story is told that John found himself at an estate sale in the southern part of the United States. All of the items in the house were going to be sold at a single price. So visitors were walking from room to room and from floor to floor in the old house, examining the various antiques and pondering what bid that they would make to buy all of the contents of the house. So John, have had, having done some research on the internet, he determined that the winning bid would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of $95,000. Felt like the, the bid of $95,000 would, would buy the house, property, and all of the contents. Now the house itself was old and in disrepair. The architecture and antiques scattered from room to room indicated that it was probably built sometime during the Civil War era. 
John also had been a history buff, not just an engineer, and for a number of years and recognized a collection of rifles from that time period that were in the estate. As John continued his investigation, he proceeded downstairs into a dark, cold, wet basement. Using the flashlight on his phone, he shines the light around and he sees an old roll-top desk located over in the corner and it's covered with cobwebs. As John searched through the poorly lit desk, he discovers a false drawer. And in the drawer, as he opened it, was a small leather pouch. John's heart begins to beat more quickly and his blood pressure rises as he begins to ponder what treasure that he might have found. John, being far from being disappointed, he opens the little leather pouch and finds 22 very well, uh, very rare pure gold coins that were minted by the Confederacy during the Civil War. To his knowledge, they were likely worth millions. Now John had to make a decision. What should I do? He's got about $10,000 in his savings account. He could sell his car, his house, and everything else that he owns, and he believes that he possibly could come up to the $95,000 estimated winning bid. But what should he do? That's case number one. Here's case study number two. Her name was Sheila. She's an art professor in a small community college in the Midwest. While traveling in Europe for the summer, she looks for paintings that she can afford to put in her own collection. While she was visiting a small village in southern France, well off the beaten path, Sheila goes to an auction and sees a painting that looks very much like an original Picasso. It is amazing and a replica, but the people at the art auction tell her it's not an original. It is deemed to be merely an extraordinary copy of Picasso's work Because the signature at the bottom does not look like Picasso's signature in other works. Sheila pulls out her magnifying glass and begins to examine the painting more carefully, realizing that she may be, in fact, in front of a rare masterpiece. Through her reading, she had learned of some of Picasso's early works. And she had discovered that in his earlier works, he did not sign his entire name. He just simply placed and scribbled his initials roughly. Picasso changed this after his first year of work when he began to sign his paintings with his full name. If this is true, Sheila is standing in front of a priceless piece of art. The price tag is $25,000, a huge sum of money for a teacher, no doubt. But if, in fact, it is an original Picasso and one or two or three believed to have been prior to his signing his full name, she was holding one of the world's rarest pieces of art worth millions. What should Sheila do? The $25,000 asking price was a joke, really, on Sheila's budget as a teacher. But her heart raced and her mind began to quickly calculate what she could do. She could sell her entire art collection. And if she sold her entire art collection, she could purchase this potential masterpiece. Sheila was at a crossroads. She could sell her current collection and instantly become a millionaire. Or she could sell her entire collection only to discover that the painting was indeed only a replica. 
what should she do? To answer this question, one must weigh both the risk, fill in the blank, and the rewards of any decision that is to be made. Risk and reward. I ask you for a moment to examine both of these study cases that I've just presented and four following questions. Number one, what are the risks? That's a fair question, isn't it? What are the risks? Number two, what are the potential rewards? Number three, what would you do? And number four, why? Four questions I want you to ponder for a moment. Think about both of these case studies that I've presented and ask yourself, what are the risks? What are the potential rewards? What would you do and why? Risk versus reward. Are you with me? The key issues in both case studies involve a number of important factors that are critical to identify and apply in order to make wise decisions. The first and most important factor, fill in the blank, the first and most important factor centers on the issue of truth, authenticity, the validity of the find, so to speak. In fact, if in fact the gold coins and the painting that Sheila has discovered are authentic, I mean, would it not be the height of foolishness for either of them not to do whatever is necessary to purchase those finds? Most of you would be shaking your head, yes. The second factor revolves around the issue of knowledge, fill in the blank, knowledge. So first of all is truth, secondly is knowledge. Both John and Sheila possess knowledge not shared by most people probably walking through those auctions and the estate sale. And in both cases, their unique knowledge and background allowed them to authenticate their findings to a very high degree of probability. The third factor, fill this in, is faith and courage. Oh, hallelujah. You see, it's one thing to intellectually believe that you have found a Picasso painting. It's quite another to sell all of your hard-earned art collection to purchase one painting. I have a third case study I want to present to you. It's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44 and 45 and 46. Listen. It's the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. You remember the story? Jesus is again speaking in parables to his disciples. Listen. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, and when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. This ancient case study is a story that Jesus told to explain the kingdom of heaven. 
And in it, he depicts a situation that would not have been uncommon in his day. Because in Jesus' day, people in lieu of a 401k or in lieu of a security box at a bank depository, they would take their treasure and hide it in a field for safekeeping. My father-in-law did the same thing, only it was in a shed in the backyard. Seriously. However, often the one who owned the treasure would often die without their relatives knowing the location of the treasure. It was not uncommon in those days for someone to find a treasure of an, of an, in another man's field buried and in this particular situation Jesus is has an explanation that has four parts to it write them down the man found a treasure of great value that's number one the man found a treasure of great value number two he covered the treasure he hid it again number three he was delirious with joy and number four he sold everything that he had in order to purchase the treasure. Jesus gives us the second story in verse 45 and 46 to make the same, same exact point but using different specifics while emphasizing the same principle. And in both stories told by Jesus, we see a picture of a reckless sacrifice and wild abandonment of a man's treasure in order to get something of far greater value. Glory to God. Far from a picture of renunciation or personal sacrifice, this is a picture of reevaluation and reward. So here's my question What do these three case studies have in common? Let me start by telling you that the 22 gold coins that John found were in fact authentic. And John has become extraordinarily wealthy. In like manner, Sheila, the young artist, had the faith and the courage to pull the trigger on her deepest intuition and is now in possession of one of the rarest Picasso paintings ever to exist. She still teaches art at her community college in the Midwest, but is now well positioned financially for the rest of her life. I love stories like that. But before we go on and examine Jesus' case study with regards to the treasure found in a field, let me ask you a couple of important questions. Do you feel sorry for John or Sheila? I mean, you've got to stop and think about this. Both of them sold everything they had. Do you feel sorry for him now? Here's the second question. Do you admire them as people who are virtuous or godly? Oh, you might think that's a strange question, but why would I ask if I think they're virtuous? The factor of the, ma of the matter is they're smart. The fact is that when I read the story of John and Sheila, the only thing that comes to my mind is that I wish I was John and knew what John knew in order to get what he got. 
Or, I wish I was Sheila and knew what she knew and was where she was to get what she got. I know y'all are more spiritual than that. In other words... I don't think that they were virtuous or righteous or better than me or better than you, but I do think that they were smart, knowledgeable, and courageously willing to pull the trigger on what they knew in order to cash in on the big prize. Now, with that in mind... I want you to look afresh with me at the case study that Jesus gives his first century followers and listeners. And in it, he explains for us how life with God really works. Okay? What what are we talking about? What is a disciple? What is a true, authentic follower of Christ look like? That's what we're getting at. How to get the very best from God and how to achieve this life of abundance and joy that Christians so often talk about. His case study teaches, fill in the blank, total commitment is the channel through which God's best and biggest blessings flow. After you fill in the blank, I want you to say that statement with me. Total commitment is the channel through which God's best and biggest blessings flow. I'm going to close with this third point. Commitment and surrender. I used the word total commitment a moment ago because they're easier to get our minds around than the concept of surrender. I, total commitment says this, quote, When I come to realize what God has done for me and who He is and what He has prepared for me in this new life, I eagerly abandon everything to obtain this fabulous, rich, rewarding, eternal life that He is offering me. Can I hear an amen? You see, surrender is not a matter of renunciation, but one of re-evaluation. I want to say that again. Surrender is not a matter of renunciation, but one of re-evaluation. So often the word surrender is associated with what we have to give up instead of what we get. Are you with me? The word surrender and total commitment that conjures up only concept of sacrifice and renunciation and missing out and losing what matters most. I am convinced that most Christians stall out in their faith when the call to total commitment is received or viewed as something that is too high of a mark, it's too high of a standard, it's too hard for me to ever attain. In our efforts at New Life Worship Center to be culturally relevant, to make people feel comfortable in church, the preaching and teaching on this subject of total commitment has been sadly omitted in too many churches. We labeled in the last 10 years some churches as seeker-friendly, okay? And I'm not here to bash anybody or throw anybody under the bus. But when I hear the term seeker-friendly, my mind immediately goes to the fact that those people are not teaching total surrender or Lordship. You're not going to hear from those pulpits, Jesus is either Lord 
of all or he's not Lord at all. Surrender is not a dirty word, folks. Total commitment is not reserved for spiritual superstars or pastors or missionaries or those who are more spiritual than regular people like you and me. Total commitment is the channel through which God's best and biggest blessings flow. And if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, I hope you get that. Total commitment is the channel through which God's biggest and best blessings flow. Let me bring it to a close here for just a moment and turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 32. Listen. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Look with me in Psalm 37, verse 4 and 5, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. Do what? Give you the desires of your heart. What does it mean to really surrender to God in order to give Him what He really wants so that He can give us His very best. What does that mean? What does that look like? We've got a few minutes before we're finished. And I'd like to ask you your opinion. What does it mean? What does it look like in your world? Total commitment. Total surrender. But pastor, I'm raising a family and I'm working a career and I'm doing my very best. No, let's talk about this for just a few moments. We've got 10 minutes or less. What does it mean to be totally surrendered. Well, let's go back to marriage again. It means, first of all, to be faithful to the covenant of marriage, right? Total surrender. I'll have no one else but you. You are my one and only. Uh, What does it mean? It means you're accountable with your time. Is that fair? You know, if I'm not home and I'm usually home, I'm calling my wife to say, hey, I got delayed, I'm at the church, I'll be here another 45 minutes, and then I'll be home. Well, what is that? That's surrender, it's submission, it's accountability, it's something all of us need. The same thing is true in our relationship with the Lord. I mean, we already know that God is all-knowing. We know that. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows where we are, when we're there. But the reality is, he wants total surrender and commitment. And even though he already knows our whereabouts, it's probably pretty good for us to communicate in our relationship with him. Well, Lord, yeah, I wasn't in church Sunday because... Or, Lord, I, I, I passed by that need that you brought right across my path because what does it mean to you? What does it mean? Anyone have a comment? Yes, ma'am? We've learned that it's our time, uh, treasures, and talents, but let's look at exactly what it is. Um, time, time. For God, we have to make time. We have to validate the time. 
and keep in mind that he's first with our time and our, and our treasures, the tithings, and we can also not just give what belongs to him, but use the treasures the Lord's given us for others. And then our talents, the gifts he's given us to use for his glory and to bless others. Amen. Good response. So here's the question. What does total commitment look like to you? What really is necessary for us to change to prove to God that we are totally committed. A willingness to change our plans. Good thought. Our careers, our jobs, our future, where we live, whether or not we're doing God's will. Right? I mean, can I, can I use me and my wife as an example? Just because that's probably the best example I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had a really good life. We were enjoying it very much. And yet God asked us to give it all up. To be obedient to Him. I believe that's an example of total surrender. Because if, I, if I'm not obedient to His beckoning and to His will, then guess what? I'm not surrendered. Did you have something you want to say? When his desire and will for our lives supersedes our own. Another very good observation about being totally surrendered. So, as we close, let me invite you tomorrow morning. How many of you know what tomorrow is? Anybody? National Day of Prayer. It's tomorrow, May the 5th, Cinco de Mayo. And we are inviting you, if you're available, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. We will be here at the church. If you would like to join us, it'll be about, I'll only be able to be here 20 to 30 minutes because I then have a prayer breakfast with the mayor of Tyler. Uh, and all of the pastors in town will hopefully be participating as we pray for our government and pray for our city and pray for our city officials and pray for one another. That will be taking place at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And so I just wanted to extend an invitation. If you don't have anything to do in the morning, bright and early, and you know, I hate mornings. I told Sister Paula, I said, honey, I said, now 6 p.m., not a problem. I'm wide awake. 6 a.m., I'm just turning over to get my other half of sleep. <laughs> but for the glory of God, John, I'm going to be in the house of the Lord in the morning with my wife at 6 o'clock, and we're going to come and we're going to pray for our church and pray for our city and pray for our nation and pray for our government and pray that somehow Jesus would come quickly. I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for an exit. I'm ready for him to restore all things. I'm looking forward to spending eternity with him and hopefully with y'all. Amen? Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. Again, if you are of a Spanish descent and you have not signed up tomorrow night, 6.30, in the Family Life Center, and this again is for just our Spanish and Latino families. Uh, we're having a celebration tomorrow evening. It's going to be an incredible time where we're celebrating their culture. And, uh, and then in June, we're celebrating black culture. In July, we're celebrating Caucasian and Asian culture. No, you can't come. No, you cannot come. Nope. This is just for them tomorrow night.
It's a, if you're married to, yes, you, if you're married to someone who is Hispanic, or... <laughs> Ancestor.com. He's going to find something in there that gets him to come to the Hispanic Festival. Amen. But it's going to be a great time tomorrow night and then on June uh, 20th. And then in July, we're doing the Asian and Caucasian. And then in October, so that nobody misunderstands me, in October, we're bringing everybody together for an international feast during our missions festival where everybody will get to enjoy everyone else's culture and, and celebrating the diversity of food and language and, and, uh, and, and, and heritage and tradition, and it's going to be a wonderful time. So if you haven't already signed up, please do so. We, it's free. By the way, it's free. And if you can, bring some family, bring some friends. One of the reasons that we're doing this is to connect with unchurched people. And you know what? If we bring one person to Jesus from a Cinco de Mayo feast, we're going to say, praise the Lord, it was all worth it. Amen? So, if you can come tomorrow night at 6.30, we've got pinatas, and we've got a surprise guest that is going to be really, 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 really fun. I'm telling you, I'm trying to hook you. I'm trying to get you convinced. God bless you. I love you. It is just a, still a couple of minutes till uh, 8 o'clock. Please sign in if you haven't for your attendance tonight. It's on the back table. If you didn't get an outline, there's also some more. Please be here next week. I'm going to be, here's what I'm talking about next week. The secret to surrender. The secret to surrender. God bless you. I love you. Look forward to seeing you this weekend. Ladies, also Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. The brunch, we already have now close to 150 ladies that are planning to attend. Bring your mother, your daughter, your baby daughter, your cousin that's female. Uh, and so come at 11 o'clock. If you haven't signed up for that, please do so as well. And at 8 o'clock, men, we've got breakfast in the fellowship hall. 8 o'clock Saturday morning. A lot going on at New Life. Yes.